Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Toronto International Film Festival's Industry Conference. Thank you for joining us live at Bell Digital Talks. As a reminder, this conversation will be available tomorrow on TIFF Digital Cinema Pro for anyone who missed it today. My name is Joanna Vicente, and I'm the executive director and co-head of TIFF. I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, and major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major industry supporters, Telefilm Canada and Ontario Creates. I am thrilled to introduce this perspective session, which is a Shatter Journey initiative generously supported by Betty and Aggie, and will spotlight through incredible, immensely talented women filmmakers currently making waves in the horror and sci-fi realm. Moderated by writer, filmmaker, and critic April Wolf. So please enjoy Sorority Row Women in Genre Filmmaking. Hello, I'm April Wolf, and uh, I want to welcome you to Sorority Row Women in Genre Filmmaking, where we will be talking about women and genre filmmaking. Um, we have three amazing panelists today, uh, all very accomplished, and um, I'm very excited to introduce them to you. First, we have the creator and executive producer of uh, the show's Killing in Seven Seconds. Uh, she also has a film premiering on Hulu through Welcome to Blumhouse called The Lie. Uh, please let me introduce you to Venus Sood. Hi, thank you Hi. for having me. I, and we can hear all the applause at home. We really can. So please. <laughs> um, our second panelist today is a writer and director of My Wedding and Other Secrets, the Kiwi series Friday Night Bites, and her new film playing here at TIFF. So please keep a, an eye out for it. Shadow in the Cloud. And this is Roseanne Lang. Hello. Hi. And we have our third panelist. Um, you know her possibly as an actor. She was in Alien Covenant and Pet Cemetery recently and uh, many, many other countless projects. But she's also the creator, writer, and director of The Girlfriend Experience and the films Sun Don't Shine and most recently She Dies Tomorrow. Please welcome Amy Simetz. You missed <laughs> Hello. Hi, you missed the killing. <laughs> I didn't, it's funny because I didn't say it because I was just like, I feel like we would get into the fact that you're also doing the killing with Vina. Yeah, <laughs> There's a big connection between it. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing too, that we can maybe even talk about first off is the fact that women working in genre cinema and television is actually still a small world. Um, and we all kind of know each other or there's a, a kind of orbit of just like, oh, you're doing this, you're doing that. You know, you see each other on festival circuits. Um, do you feel like you're crossing paths with a lot of a lot more women, uh, maybe more recently than than you had before? Uh, I mean, I feel that in the television space, there's uh, there's always been it's almost like the true early Hollywood that had literally all women screenwriters mm -hmm. writing everything um, before the guys showed up and, and kind of stole the scene. Um, I feel like there have been a lot of worker bee women writers uh, behind the scenes in terms of television genre, crime genre, um, and, and showrunners, you know, mm -hmm. too. Um, unheralded, you know, the men come along and do what we did and then they get the credit. Um, but I feel that there, um, there certainly is more now, you know, and in terms of directing, that is the biggest hill, the biggest mountain to climb for women in terms of genre. Still. Still. Yeah. Uh, Roseanne, I'm curious about your perspective too, because coming from New Zealand, um, where you are right now, um, it's also a smaller microcosm of cinema too. Um, do you feel like you are crossing paths with more women in, in genre or even just more women in the industry in general? Um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly, um, the, the things that are happening in, in Hollywood and, um, across the world are the same things that are happening in New Zealand, but on a much smaller scale. Um, <clears throat> we, we, yeah, it is very kind of insular. 
um, in terms of it's a, it's a small community and everyone knows each other. But there's a, it's a, I think, you know, there is a feeling that um, there are possibly more opportunities in genre, not just well, for everyone, uh, but also women, especially women, because we're looking for that other voice, the voice that hasn't spoken yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, whether those will actually turn into real things is unknown at this point. I mean, it always is. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, also, I, I feel like when I go to film festivals, specifically genre film festivals, um, uh, you know, Fantasia just wrapped up in Canada um, earlier. And uh, I feel like I find a lot of great allies in the women who attend those because they're just like, oh, I see you. I'm going to connect with you. I'm going to talk to you specifically because you're the other woman in the room. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, sorry, this is a bad uh, example, but, you know, dogs on the street. If you see another dog, you, you, you sort of go for that, you know, you're like, oh, oh, I, you're one of me, you know, we can, we can talk together. Um, but uh, I, I don't, I think, I think that's becoming less of a thing now. I think, um, you know, this is hopefully, I mean, this is just my personal opinion, is that we never have to have women in front of our filmmaker, you know, instead of being introduced as a women filmmaker, we're just filmmakers and we're, it, do you, is that a contentious thing to say? No, no, it's not. Which is also one of the reasons why this uh, this session is actually going to focus mostly on craft. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to get into our um, our process of idea generation and idea generation specifically tied to, you know, genre. I would love to know um, the process that you guys have in, in finding that idea, whether it's like um, searching through uh, news clippings or, you know, trying to combine two uh, different movies to try to make one that you want. How do you guys um, begin to find the stories that, that resonate for you? Amy, do you want to start? Sure. Um, it's a, I, I mean, it, it's different for TV versus the independent work that I do. So, um, you know, I I wish that I could, could control what the executives want <laughs> for television, um, but I can't. Uh, but but uh, for at least for for the independent work that I do or have done, it, it's, um, I think it, it, I have like some sort of a tone or mood that I want to execute before I have the story mm-hmm. um, and something I want to explore, something that is, is hard to put into words. And I um, and beca- and the reason I lean more towards uh, genre or genre bending is because I'm, quite honestly, not inspired by positivity or happiness. Um, <laughs> we just, no just I'm going to get you. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I, it's usually unrest and anxiety. And, and so I lean a lot more towards, you know, um, uh, genre, but I, but also in a way that, you know, I, yes, I, uh, technically speaking, I, and, and craft wise, like I, I prefer that they just call me a filmmaker, but at the same time, I think that what's interesting about women or what why I'm drawn to it is from the time I was little, a little girl, I, I, it's built into us to sort of fear like men and fear something that's going to attack you and that you're vulnerable, even if you, even if you, you know, don't feel that, even if you take self-defense classes, it's like, it's still in response to a fear-based sort of existence in some, yeah. on some level. So, um, so that for me is, is sort of, the, but with television, it's completely different and, and sort of, um, I am more attracted to the genre, uh, elements, but, uh, just in my personal work, it's, it's always about uh, whatever I make or, or, or undertake an independent film. It's, it's usually caught like born out of unrest, which lends itself to genre. Mm-hmm. And Vina, you keep nodding your head. So I'm assuming you have something to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, Amy and I, I share a lot in terms of our inspirations and, and I love her work and I love her films. And, um, you know, tonally, we share, we share, like, we have a, a lot of kind of share, shared instincts and inspirations. I also feel that um, in terms of the training that we have as women, um, it was very interesting to grow up watching Hitchcock and watching crime and mystery genres and mm-hmm. wars uh, because my parents, 
you know, were immigrants and they just kind of turned the television on and there was no kind of what's appropriate and not appropriate. It's like, go ahead, watch The Exorcist if you want. That's cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I was exposed at a really young age to these very intense genres that for the most part had a lot of female leads, you know, mm -hmm. psycho female leads, psycho female heroes. And the so-called scream queen was almost the subversive element of a woman who could be have agency in the arc of a story. Um, and when I did, you know, from from the killing to seven seconds to the stranger on Quibi to to the lies a little different. It's more of a family drama. Um, but I was really interested in how to subvert the idea of the female victim and make her the female hero. And in genre, we can do that. There's a space for that type of hero. Uh, it's almost like what, what Jordan did with Get Out. You know, you can kind of fly a little bit under the radar and entertain mm -hmm. still and create, you know, uh, a universal appeal, though none of this is conscious, right? But it, it happens to kind of come together yeah. in terms of the genre elements, but then put your outlier wo women, you know, in these roles of hero. Yeah, because you're not beholden to, to realism to a certain extent. I mean, it depends on like the tone that you're creating. There's obviously well, with se seven seconds, for instance, if I'm thinking about like TV, like there is a uh, you are beholden to a specific kind of realism. Yeah, you're beholden to the realism of the genre itself. So the, the, the devices of the genre of any crime or mystery genre will demand a, a certain, you know, certain elements and certain arcs, but then you can put outlier characters who so often live in these genres and they're usually, you know, the, 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 the alcoholic, you know, male detective who like has a relationship with a prostitute, mm -hmm. you know, the anti-hero can be a female anti-hero, you know, mm -hmm. or a woman of color anti-hero. Um, and slip into, you know, under the radar into those roles of agency much easier, I think, than in, you know, your straight forward drama. Um, I I would say that that's a nice segue to talk about Roseanne's movie, too, and the way that you're kind of approaching um, that type of uh, switch, because you do have um, a, a female character and what might be traditionally a male role. Can you talk about your ideation process, how you kind of um, come through to, to finding um, this this right story for, for you and the right story that, to tell for maybe a, a female lead? Um, you know, I, I loved what Vina was saying about, you know, we why do women have to be noble and wise and um, kind and good all the time? You know, I think that the characters that we love um, in in the in the movies and shows that we've been watching, through, you know, through our childhood to now, are the ones that are villainous, are the ones that are really complicated. How how come there are so there is such a breadth of you know good on the on the on the scale of good to evil for mm -hmm. the male characters, but not so much for women. Yeah. And um, I, certainly with Shadow in the Cloud, I think this this kind of hero, kind of scrappy, kind of messy, doesn't always make the best choices, doesn't always act in the for the greater good. Um, is something that I'm really interested in, and and really we should you know we are making more of. Um, so it, maybe it's a sense of filling the gaps. I, I don't want to be contrary for the sake of being, you know, I don't want to be contrarian for the sake of being contrary. It's not exactly like, um, uh, oh, I'll go where no one else has gone before, but it's it's, it's a sense of um, what what story, um, what, what are the kinds of things that get my juices flowing that I, you know, that, that these things haven't, these spaces haven't been filled yet. Mm -hmm. um, or told, told in quite the way that we can tell them. Um, that I think maybe that's part of the ideation process for me. Yeah. In, in, you know, you're touching on something else that I wanted to get into this. I was actually going back and I love reading old <clears throat> interviews with filmmakers, but I was going back and reading an old interview from 1991 with Callie Corey recently uh, around the release of Thelma and Louise. And she was kind of lamenting the fact that so many uh, critics, so many people who were interviewing her kept talking about the these messy, terrible women. And there was not really a sympathy for them at that time. And and I think now we have a kind of revisionist history of just like, oh, we've always loved Thelma and Louise. But, mm -hmm. you know, from and I still see that today in terms of how we talk about women, where there's this idea that they need to be role models. 
on the screen, um, more so than men. They have to be role models. They have to do the right thing. Otherwise, um, you know, they are opened up to so much more criticism. I do see that fading away um, in time, but I'm curious about you guys and, and how you um, approach the quote unquote likability factor of your, uh, you know, complex female characters, you know, what kind of um, things that you do to, to try to enamor them with the audience? Nothing. I mean, I, nothing. I have no interest in enamoring anybody with anybody. <laughs> um, my job as a storyteller is to speak truth in fiction, right? Mm -hmm. And so whether it's a female, male character, whatever character, as long as I get them and I understand them and I can walk in their shoes, like that's my job, right? I mean, I'm not a politician, you know, I'm not, I don't make commercials so you can buy soap. You know, I, I write, we write stories so that you can walk in the complicated shoes of life as we know it, especially as women, um, and, and know that this is true, that this mm -hmm. is a true story and I'm not watching a story about a blow up doll, you know? Um, so <laughs> that's it. <laughs> It's true. Well, I, 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 exactly. I don't actually think about likability. It's more of a uh, fast, like fascinating is what I think is like, this is fascinating or, you know, alluring is another thing. It's like if what they're doing is alluring, then uh, hopefully an audience will like it. But that, that is definitely a conversation that's had mostly in, in television, mm -hmm. you know, um, still, but, uh, but yes, the, the tide it really, it, it is shifting a lot. I have noticed, though, that they, even though they say they want complicated women, they want me to, in my experience for writing for television and, 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 and not every single instance, but that I notice that the, if I do something well, like say, like the girlfriend experience, right? And yeah. like writing for another show is that they, they're like, oh, great, you do that brand of female messy now just like replicate that. And they, they, they don't realize that they have an idea of what I'm, what they want me to write, even mm -hmm. though I'm attacking it from a different angle, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Cause like, I think even people, like even um, people who are like, we want more fe complicated female characters. They still have this like list of requirements of what becomes a complicated female character. You know, and it, and you you as an artist, you're like, yeah, but we have now we have to go over here and make it more interesting and fascinating because we've already seen, you know, Nurse Jackie or or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, um, and so it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting dance that you play with with uh, getting work made with complicated women because they still there's still like criteria of what that means even if it's, um, you know. You're not like, oh, she's a mom and she worked really hard. She went to Harvard and she's the smartest woman in the room or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's still like a weird list of criteria, I find, at least in my my experience. You know, there's a I, I am sorry, I forget who said this, um, uh, but I was reading an interview with a filmmaker who said um, when you make a uh, complex woman character, you don't have to have the audience like them, but you need them to be loved. Um, and, and kind of separating this idea of um, like and love, where you don't have to like their choices, but you have to feel kind of um, compassion for them or some kind of um, uh, pull to them or something. And, uh, you know, Roseanne, you were nodding your head too when, when Amy was talking. Do you have um, some experiences of, of kind of people wanting to dictate what they think is, is an appropriate complex female character in your work or? Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, not not so much recently. I think people more recently, in my most recent experience, it's like, no, you tell you tell us what what you think is good and what you think is right. Mm -hmm. um, and and I and I and I, you know, I, I think that's probably been built on years of um, this kind of uh, would you say activism? You know, like uh, let let us speak for ourselves. Let us let us um, uh, you know earn and um, uh, fight for the thing the kinds of stories that we want to tell if it, you know I, I, this is not genre but um i was watching i may destroy you and the fact that michaela cole allowed us to sit in her in her in her uh flaws for so long um was a very clear i found was a very i think it was a very clear choice mm -hmm. is that you know i the, my growing up in patriarchy growing up um with patriarchal you know subconscious things where you start to judge her and start to think, oh, actually, maybe she had some responsibility in what happened to her, mm -hmm. um, is quite, 
quite a clear choice uh, of of the of the storyteller to make me feel uncomfortable with who I am and and the the the, the world that I've grown up in. You know, I'm I'm just as bad as the rest of them, um, mm-hmm. and and I'm and I'm just as patriarchal. You know, there are sort of um, so I guess. I don't know. I mean, I um, we this is the thing is that is do we care about this? But um, we've grown up being able to watch you know male heavy movies, genre films, and be able to find a connection and empathy between their, their characters. You know, we've become literate in um, taking something from watching male characters. Is there a world where men can watch um, a breadth of female characters and find connection as well? Do they need to learn a literacy um, that we have for male characters? Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's something too. Is just like how much are we asking our audiences to 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 do to do that work and and to feel uncomfortable with themselves? Um, but you know, genre I think has fairly recently um, gotten more comfortable with making people uncomfortable uh, in in those ways. So I appreciate that. Another thing that might make audiences uncomfortable today that I wanted to talk about is ambiguity. And in terms of genre, ambiguity ambiguity, um, can be wielded so wonderfully because um, we actually have the opportunity to maybe not tell everyone everything all the time. It's not like a rom-com where you're just like, all things have to wrap up so nice and neatly, you know? Um, And I'm curious how you guys feel about that and its use, you know? Do you feel that you have to have every bit explained, every single thing tight, um, because that's what audiences are very interested in? Or do you feel like you can leave some things unsaid? Um, Vina? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's changed over the course of, um, and quite quickly, audience expectations in terms of information. So when I first did The Killing and we did not solve the mystery of the murder uh, mm-hmm. in season one, there's a great, uh, you know, kind of outcry um, around changing uh, an expectation of the genre. Um, but what I have found, and I think this is partially because of the amount of content that exists now, um, that there, you know, our emotional IQ uh, and story IQ, you know, as, as a nation and as a world has just risen exponentially because there is so much diverse, genre breaking, ambiguous, plethora of storytelling now. And, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I heard John Wells once say, assume your audience is far smarter than you are. And that's been the operating kind of my operating principle when I make story is, they know people know we have these instinctual we have these instincts we know we can tell by the flick of an eyelid we can tell what an actor feels we don't need to have everything spelled out and in fact if we do we'll be bored out of our fucking minds you know Mm -hmm. and so i think it's really uh delightful you know to see audiences you know i'll go to the midwest and, and visit my family the accountants and they'll be talking about character development and plot you know and and I'm like, my God, <laughs> I better keep up. This is an arms race. I actually have to work an arms a, race <laughs> as a storyteller to keep up with the audience. You know? <laughs> and it's it's a wonderful time to live in. So um, yeah, I mean, there's no need to dumb down because our audience is smarter than we are. I mean, are you guys are you doing research in that respect to try to stay ahead of your audience? For instance, like, does that require research? I mean, I'll I'll get to that too. But um, I mean, did you have anything to say about ambiguity? Because I feel like you would yeah. with, <laughs> with she dies tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's the same thing as what what Vina say. I mean, with that in particular, obviously. I, I mean, why well, shouldn't say that? But with uh, it's we are so bombarded with like our everyone's so media savvy just in general like not just in um not just in like what you say like cinema you know like that we're just like bombarded with film language like all the time mm-hmm. whether that's like just through the ads or tiktok or instagram you know what I mean? like the, you you it's just we're so bombarded that like if you just it's gotten even more sophisticated and so leaning into that is I, I think more exciting and and specifically with with she dies tomorrow that was the the other thing that I always I always talk about is um it's it's less ambiguity for ambiguity's sake and more about leaving the audience with the questions that you want them to be left with as opposed to intentionally being like I'm just being obtuse because like fuck you <laughs> you know <Yeah>. excuse me <laughs> sorry but but you know what I mean but There's it's not here. 
<laughs> I just remembered it's Canada. You guys are so polite. Um, but uh, but I, I, you know what I mean. It's not. It's not a. It's not for me. It was like what I'm ma in making. She dies tomorrow. It's like I am an artist. I am making this. These are the questions I want you to be left with. Same with with um, uh, Sundown Shine, and even in the girlfriend experience. It's like mm -hmm. you know. It's it's like these are. I'm leaving this out. And there, and I know it's aggravating, but think about the questions that I'm leaving with you with, you know, as opposed to what you're not getting, you know, and, um, and I think you can do that a lot. I think it frustrates people, but I think you can get away with a lot now because of the way that we're so, I guess, groomed in a way to, to a film language. Roseanne, I mean, could could you could you maybe ex expand on on your head nodding of of uh, of Amy's points here about uh, ambiguity and the questions that you want to leave people with? Yeah, I mean, what Amy said about you know you 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 it's very assured and motivated what what you're doing. Like I love being having my hand taken through a story by someone who knows who who I feel knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. they, they know what they're doing to me, as opposed to oh you know I'm going to be mysterious and you know I I um. I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it watching Tenet. I, I was like, do, am I safe in the storyteller's hands? I mean, I love, I love Nolan. I'm, I'm, I do, but like, why did he make those choices with the sound mix where I couldn't comprehend? Anyway, I'm just saying like, <laughs> well, this has gone into just, a Tenet review. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I just, I'm just saying that, you know, like I have to ask the questions. Am I safe? Does the storyteller mean to do that to me? Did he mean to confuse me? Like, do, or, you know, and, and the same goes with, with what, you know, what, with what ambiguity, so mm -hmm. long as it's motivated and you can, you can justify and earn the ambiguity as a, to yourself. You don't necessarily need to spell it out. I, don't, I think audiences, uh, as you say, are more sophisticated these days and enjoy being able to put together, you know, that's part of the satisfaction of storytelling. But, you know, being able to, uh, to feel like it's assured and the storyteller intended me to be confused or, leave an open-ended something that's that's when i feel like someone you know that's when i feel good about watching a story on screen yeah i think that, i mean sorry do you uh, that's actually something i forgot th that soderbergh and i talk about all the time which is there's a difference between ambiguity and confusion you know what i mean like you don't you never want your audience confused you you, you but you want them to feel like they're they're going along with the movie but there's a difference between there's a clear difference between confusion and ambiguity you know mm -hmm. they might think they're confused but like do, you know what i mean like some like my, my mom sometimes when she watches my movies she's she's like and then she and she like phrases everything like a question and i'm like yes that's what happened and she thinks she's confused but she's getting the movie do you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so i think audience it's an in, it's an interesting dance that you play with it with it yeah you guys are kind of bringing up something that that itches me a little bit when it when it comes to this though um and and the fact is that um uh i think that aud some audiences still assume intention on the mil uh, male filmmakers that they don't assume intention on female film sorry female filmmakers meaning that they assume that maybe a woman made a mistake or didn't intend to do something as opposed to kind of like a purposeful ambiguity or a purposeful um you know like open ended type of thing um and i see that sometimes when i read reviews and i and i you know i i just wonder if if you guys have to or have had to struggle um, to get that across that you have an intention that everything you're doing in the story has a purpose and and whether that's like talking to the, the people who are uh, reading an early stage of a script or people who are you know pro providing financing or anything like that do you ever have to struggle to say that like no there's a reason for all of these things if, if, if you have a good if you have a because I guess our job as storytellers is to communicate. If we can, if we can be in the war room and justify why we're doing things, generally people will listen. Just in my experience, I've never had anyone, you know, doubt. If 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 I if I'm straight in my head, then I've I've usually been able to convince someone of that. Yeah. But I don't I don't know if that if that's um your experience, Vina or Amy. I mean, I feel that I agree with you in the war room because there is a partnership aspect to the creation of something together that if, you know, if I feel deeply passionate and I can argue and, you know, 
describe why I want something, um, if not understanding, then you know approval. Um, and but but I find on the other end, as you were saying, you know, in the review process, um, there is a very 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 distinct um, lack of confidence in the intelligence and intention of women creators and filmmakers. Um, that's been my experience. You know, it's usually like she's made mistakes, you know, she doesn't know what she's doing. And, um, you know, she tried to do this and it didn't work. And but this filmmaker did male filmmaker did it and it does work. And we we're doing the exact same thing. So there is a subjectivity to the review world. Um, that I have. And again, this is bringing together television and film is, uh, you know, that's that's the next battlefront is the fourth estate and leveling the field in terms of the subjectivity in terms of reviewers, you know, because there is, it does feel very much, there is a questioning of female intelligence, you know, in terms of creation where yeah. men kind of get, get away with whatever choice. Speaking of questioning female intelligence, please let me remind all people watching this that they can submit questions in that little chat box on the left side of their screen because we're going to get to some of those in uh, just a bit. So please, please send in some questions for these lovely women. And if you can ask them craft questions, how they make things, that's always wonderful. Uh, because I think tying into this, Vina, is the fact that um, a lot of people don't ask women craft questions. So they don't assume that intentionality because they don't assume that we know how to do things that we jump on set and are just like, I don't know, maybe. Um, and one thing when it comes to genre that I think becomes a kind of barrier for some women to get on set and to try to direct is the idea that genre is the space where you have to understand technical camera things. You have to understand a, a special effects. You have to understand how to shoot like a, an action sequence or a gun sequence. And I was wondering if you guys could um, maybe walk us through some of the things that, that you've kind of um, maybe either learned along the way or just figured out like, I'm going to get on set and I'm just going to like, uh, you know, uh, do a special effects sequence. I mean, I... <laughs> As an Asian person, um, I don't know whether the, this is kind of done tongue in cheek, but the fact that, you know, Asians are good at math and, 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 and I was one of those people. And, and the fact that I, like I walk on set and I sometimes I've had to reference the fact that I also have a computer science degree. So you don't need to worry about, you know, my technical. Um, <laughs> acumen uh, is that the right word? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, I will be uh, calling you for help on things then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I know my way inside out of you know technology, and and I'm also you know interested in you know in the nerds and elements of that. So I don't know whether or not you know it's it, it is tongue in cheek, but the, but the fact that I'm uh, Asian, um, that, that's a that's a dumb thing to to bring up, but um, but but sometimes I do bring it up. <laughs> like for the like joke. In your opening speech, like when the crew's there, you're like, okay, so yeah. And they're like, should we take that uh, seriously? Or? <laughs> Is, are we allowed to laugh? Is she being racist right now? <laughs> Vina, how about you? I mean, did you have any kind of like technical kind of hurdles that, or, or even just emotional hurdles about the technical things that you were afraid to get into? Or you know, uh, I mean, uh, most of the work I've done has been quite uh, slow burn. You know, Vista, you know, widescreen. And so when I did the the Stranger for Quibi, um, there was it was it was almost constantly moving camera and many visual effects, which I had not done before. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was, um, you know, I was I was challenged and excited by having a new crayon in, in the box. And and I went to my good friend, Victoria Mahoney, who directed second unit for Star Wars, first mm -hmm. woman, you know, to do that. And, and I said, Vic, how do you shoot action and visual effects? And she showed me all this shit. And she said, do it from the heart, you know? Like there, here's the language of action. Here's an, here's like the classic language of an action film or an mm -hmm. action sequence. And now, what is it for you? Like, what do you feel? Were you in a car racing to catch up with someone and then spinning around? Like, what would you feel? So we just broke it down from there. So it was like formal technique uh, meets kind of how do we get into it? And if not subvert the way things have been done, 
imprint it with kind of your own emotionality because mm-hmm. that's what you're doing as a filmmaker is bringing your own voice to it. So that was really exciting. You're just relying on another woman who's done it before and, and has done it really well. I mean, if I if I think about Amy's film, She Dies Tomorrow, and I'm thinking about trying to replicate an emotion on screen, I think perhaps, Amy, you uh, work in the same way um, of trying to design these effect sequences and things. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have a budget for effects, but thank you for thinking that. Effects. <laughs> <laughs> the, the effects, well, talking on a technical side, I mean, to me, it's always just been exploration in like in a geeky way, right? And like, and I, it's, it's hard for me. Uh, well, two things. Well, the, all of my, my entire career has been getting my hands dirty, like yeah. boom mopping, putting my hands on a camera, like doing B cam for my movies. Like on, on She Dice Tomorrow, I, I operated second camera and had operated some of the stuff on, on, on Sun Don't Shine. And, and so I like technically speaking, and I edited all my, all my stuff early on. And then, um, and then realized this is another th- the good thing to realize when you're a director is realizing your shortcomings, which is, I'm terrible at media managing. So that's why I have an editor. <laughs> it's like, otherwise I would love to edit everything. I'm just terrible at like making sure on the back end of things that it, the, the workflow is good. Mm-hmm. But, um, so, but, but, uh, so for me developing, and even with like the effects, like that, that was me experimenting in my garage, like the sort of inner body and, uh, you know, outer space sort of looking stuff. That was me going to Michael's and buying Rit dye and glitter and taking plant material from my yard and like throwing it on this piece of plexiglass and me and Jay, my cinematographer, playing with these mac- these wild macro lenses and just playing, you know, and not approaching it, not approaching it like we're going to be the smartest people in the world. It's like you just remember that this is playing, you mm-hmm. know, and that the best art is, you know, is you find it through playing and then um and the more technically skilled you get or the, the you know doing you know just by working you you just have this you know, backlog of knowledge i will say that when i was doing my first tcas with uh steven Sutterberg and lodge kerrigan um that all of the questions that came to me were for the girlfriends um what the first one of the questions that are all the questions were that that came to me were all like, do you think that uh, that being a escort is a is a viable career for a woman? And I was like, I what? And that they they'd all direct to me. And then there was one that was so offensive that they Stephen, who's awesome, was an executive producer, but he didn't he was never on set. I think he came for lunch one day and left. But like they asked a lot. They go Lodge and Stephen. Um, can you talk about how you created the tone for the girlfriend experience? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, it's like, it's, it, it is. And I hadn't really, because I, 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 I had up, up until really that point, I mean, aside from doing the killing, but as a director had worked in these really, I, I and, and honestly in the independent film world, um, in these safe environments where the, I knew a lot of, female filmmakers and mm-hmm. I knew a lot of male fi- filmmakers who highly respected me. So I hadn't really experienced that, um, that level of like, Oh wow. They just asked, they, they want to know my feeling. They, they want to know the feelings questions and the like social issue questions with me. It's my responsibility to explain like what women should do, but yeah. the technical, no, I hadn't experienced it until that moment. So it's wow, a, it's a fuck feeling. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think something that you're saying, though, uh, is is really salient. And that's the fact that um, uh, uh, when you're doing these sequences, when you're designing these kind of tonal um, effects things, um, that it is a lot of playing still. And I, I, I like I want to hit that again, because if you go back and you watch, you know, kind of like groundbreaking, like Cronenberg uh, commentary from like scanners or, or any of these things that really um, set the, the bar for effects or anything, it's just a bunch of people, mostly men, who are just like going to a craft store and trying some shit out. And I think that there's, we have this idea that like, um, that we can't do it, but it is, it's just, it's playing. It's, you're still playing. You're still um, experimenting and trying to find things as long as you're looking for creative solutions. Um, 
we we might actually go to questions a little bit early because I'm really liking some of the ones that are coming in. So if you guys don't mind, I'd love to oh, awesome. read some questions for you guys. Um, because let me find this one right here. Um, Jay Everly has a question. Um, and uh, this one is... Can you talk about a successful genre pitch and what you think uh, helped make studios and investors buy in? I think that that's a really fantastic practical question for a lot of people watching. Um, I mean, I sold something recently, uh, a genre pitch, a sci-fi, and it's it's very new for me, the, that, that world. And, um, you know, and, and I don't know if this is just going to sound super standard, but just I, you know, I had um, a very uh, well thought out lookbook, you know, and, and a conversation that would go along with it that was very kind of back and forth, but also, you know, character based and, you know, played with the arcs going, you know, throughout the story. And the one thing I have to say is Zoom is pretty amazing as a way to pitch and sell because unlike back in the day when you're just like blah, blah, yourself talking or holding up visuals or having a tiny laptop in a room with seven people, you know, and or handing out pictures, you can have your screen dominate the entire visual kind of field. So it's, I think it's a very uh, experiential different experience, you know, to like have this mysterious voice talking you through a story on a device, you know, that is 100% captivating, you know, mm -hmm. and you're alone in your house and you can have that private experience beside, you know, instead of being like, okay, my assistant's walking in, here comes the lunch and then what's John doing and how's Jane reacting? And so that is all gone, you know, in the Zoom world. So I, I think that that's to our advantage. So um, you would request a Zoom pitch in the future, do you think? Um, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the future? I don't know if that would happen. I will bring a giant screen next time. I will have, I will turn off the light if we ever get to see each other in person again, yes. and have a giant screen and replicate this experience because I think it does it does help a lot. Um, and also, if you're a pitcher and you have to pitch for like 20 minutes, and I, I like to pitch and I pitch a lot, but it scares the shit out of me every time I do it. Is you're not even there, you know? You can like yeah. get rid of yourself, you know. I say, hey guys, guess what? You can get rid of me and just see the screen, and they do, and it's no pressure. That's, I mean, it takes out the quotient. And there's a, a guy fell asleep once while I was pitching in his office. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it'd be a lot harder to do on Zoom, I think. I, I agree, though. I think Zoom pitching has been a lot easier. Uh, Roseanne, Amy, do you have something to say about how to craft the perfect genre pitch and to get investors excited? Um, I've been... I'm the worst person to ask about this stuff. <laughs> I like, I think I go into a fugue state when I pitch. Like I literally go in, I like, I, 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 I feel like I might be a snake oil salesman and something clicks in and it's not the best part of my personality. I'm being very <laughs> honest. <laughs> Where it's like, I don't even know if I believe what I'm saying, but we're going. And then, and I think it really, but, but it also comes a lot along with, to be quite honest, you you know you you have to be okay with losing, which is part of any good pitch. Do you know what I mean? You have to be okay, and you have to walk in. And mm -hmm. like because I have um, nine jobs, because I have because um, <laughs> I do so many things, but because I have this this knowledge in the back of my head where it's like I'm gonna do this with or without you. Mm -hmm. You know. I just that's that's that sort of drives me. But in terms of like the arc of it, I I swear to God, I go in, I say a bunch of stuff, <laughs> and um, when I leave, it's I really do forget what I've said. Um, and because like I have friends that are like, we practice our pitch and we do all this. So I'm saying I'm saying that works for me. So don't take my advice. But. <laughs> 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 but, I, but part of it too is that I think it's a, a coping mechanism is like I leave when I leave part of the like the thing is like I forget what I said because I have to let it go or you know what I mean like I have to yeah. move on to the next thing or whatever and having that attitude I think helps me really just keep making more work you know. I was actually high once during a pitch talking <laughs> about food <laughs> yeah. Was it good? It was, yeah, it was, it was good. basically a short story. I was, I ate something. I had an allergic reaction. My producers were like, the pitch is five minutes away. Your face is the size of a watermelon. Oh my God, what are we going to do? My face like had gotten this big from the allergic reaction. They gave me all of this 
something antihistamine, blah, blah, which gets me high. Apparently, oh, yeah. I did not know this. I walk into the pitch. My face started, half of the face came down. I was high. I was like oh, looking like the elephant man. And I just went into fugue state and blah, blah. And, you know, I had practice, so my body had muscle memory. But then halfway through the pitch, I was like, why don't I just start talking about something else? And <laughs> Because this is this is kind of a cool idea I had, and it was just this insane, crazy shit. And you could see every executive's eyes be like, and my producer had to literally be like, "I'm sorry, but she's high off of <laughs> anti medicine, anti whatever." Medicine. I mean, that's it's sold. It's sold. So it's sold. Okay, okay. it's sold. It's sold. So definitely yeah. do what Vina yeah. does. Um, get high. Get high. <laughs> Don't practice. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Take the That's edge off. I'm going to do this without, with or without you. <laughs> and tell them that. I'm going to do this with or without Don't ever tell them that. <laughs> How about you, Roseanne? What What do you got for us? What's your, what's no, your I, I I'm sorry. I can't talk that. Like, getting high and saying, I'm doing this. Yeah, but, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm walking. You, you can come on this train or not, you know, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I can't add anything to that. That's, that's different. <laughs> Do you have, do you walk into the room with like a special walk, you know, like a, like that confident I, saunter? I do. I do. I, I, I do. Oh God, this is going to sound so bad. But no, it won't. Bit, but like, you know, I, I don't, because, you know, Lord Grant needs the confidence of a mediocre white man. And, 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 and I, you know, and that's kind of cliche now because everyone says it, mm -hmm. but like, but yes, you know, would, would, um, uh, we tend to overthink, right? We want to be twice as good. We want to, we want to be super good. And we will, and we walk in with all these anxieties about, oh, you know, but they might ask me about these tiny little things about, you know, that I haven't figured out yet. But no, you, uh, so definitely a walk. I think definitely a, a confidence and a swagger has served me well, uh, so, so far. So I don't, I don't know. But then someone might say, you know, that, that, uh, arrogant asshole Roseanne, you know, I don't, someone might be saying that. So I, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's also a little follow-up question i think from francine zuckerman who's who's asking how difficult was it to pitch and finance your first projects but i i would like to go into maybe if you guys could just very quickly tell me how long it took to um to get your your first projects um accepted your first projects finance produced like was it like uh um you know did you have 10 plus failures along the way like w what did you have um, I, I was very lucky. I had a short film because I've only really been in, I've only had representation in America for three years. And so off the back of a short film that did well at um, Sundance and South by an action genre film, I was able to get scripts. And then um, one of the scripts I was interested, this, the script that I was interested in became Shadow in the Cloud. So mm -hmm. it was kind of, first one uh, seemed to go quite well. Yeah. And um, also a follow up for you, uh, Roseanne, too, because Tazine Ahmed has said, um, quote, independent cinema from developing nations are often dependent on international film funding. Uh, one hurdle of a film female filmmaker friend was facing was that her story was not complex woman marginal enough. For example, it wasn't about f fighting domestic violence. How do you get people to pay attention to cultural specific women's stories, which are not about extreme scenarios? Um, and I, for me, I'm going to take that in terms of like... <clears throat> There's a, uh, uh, you are a, an Asian New Zealand filmmaker. Um, do you feel like you would have to tell a very specific kind of like Asian New Zealand story to get people to, to take, uh, you know, your, your story and, and, and finance it? Obviously, your, your star of this of movie that you have is, is not Asian New Zealand, however. <laughs> so have no. you had any issues with that kind of thing? People are like, we want something from exactly your experience. Well, I mean, this, this speaks to a deeper question about find your voice and who you are. And um, often that is about culture and usually dramas and, you know, uh, non-genre work. So if you have a love for genre like I did, like, so my first film was an autobiographical story about my life as a Kiwi Chinese person. And that, I mean, it did okay, but because it was a romantic comedy with no stars in it, it didn't really take off the way that I thought I would. So there was a there was a gap of 10 years in between making a, a romantic comedy with no stars and in me making this movie. And and it, it 
it's like the opportunities are there if you can if you like people why do people go to the movies anymore they go for genre they go for the, the spectacle and mm -hmm. i i guess i uh, you know like do, if i was to only make stories about my experience as a kiwi chinese person like is that if, and if, with while aspiring to make you know the kind of <clears throat> movies that i want to make are terminator 2 shouldn't i be allowed to make my version of terminator 2 you know like that, that yes you it, should right i mean we all should be able to make those big movies and we're capable of doing that um so i don't i don't necessarily agree with people who say oh you need to be what does that mean speaking from the heart speaking from your experience if your experience is if, if that's not where you want to go then i wouldn't empower anybody of any background to make the kinds of films that they want to make whether they've got people who look like them in it or not I mean, I can throw this question to uh, Vina and Amy too. Just, do you ever have people who are expecting you to kind of put your own kind of personal experience in it, or like put your trauma on the page in some sense, or just expect that of you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, but I, that's also that's also a um, uh, a thing that I've recently reconciled for myself is is sort of. Because when I, and I've gotten a lot better at saying no to things. There was a period of time where I was just so excited that people wanted me to write anything mm -hmm. that I was saying yes to everything. And then it was, it was a very overwhelming. And I, and, and I learned this about myself, which is doesn't matter what, like if, how commercial the thing is, I'm going to, I'm just the type of writer that wants to put myself into, not as an actor, I put myself into the writing, you know, mm -hmm. it'd be awesome if I tried to cast myself and everything I wrote, but like, but, <laughs> but um, the roles, all of it, all the roles, all of it, just all of the roles. Yeah. But, it, but you know what I mean? Like I, it, it's hard and I don't say myself meet, like it just, it's just, it, I, and I, it, I find it hard to actually sit down and write if I'm not doing that anyways. Um, but I do, I do think that there, like I was saying before, is like, I, I have felt the, you know, and I don't think that people are aware of it. I have felt the list of criteria of like, well, this is a female story. Like I tried to write something about an incel and they're like, well, this isn't really female driven. And I was like, but I'm scared of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, how does that not have anything to do with me? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, so it's, it's like, I guess that's that, that specific instance. And then these other things, it's like, they want, they, 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 when I speak to them, I'm, I'm aware that they want something that's like your experience as a woman, but they have an idea of what that is as opposed to what I am bringing to sub, to a subject in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Vina, do you have anything? Roman? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand Tesney's question because I think there is an exotification of the third world female in cinema, right? There has to be like the third world experience of, of a brown woman or a black woman uh, that is consumable for, you know, first world people, yeah. um, which I, I can't even, it's just so frustrating that that's the only perception of, of third world people. Um, as a first world woman of color, on the other hand, no one wants to hear you know, about race in America until recently. So, you know, I created, my first show I created was 10 years ago. And, you know, and this was pre Me Too, pre Uprising, you know, pre Black Panther, pre, you know, Crazy Rich Asians. And there was a very, very distinct message that I got very clear uh, from the beginning of my career that um, a little bit was okay, but don't really show up because we don't really want to hear it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very grateful things are changing now and there's an openness um, in our industry to stories that really reflect the real America. Um, but I think that, you know, there really is so much more that needs to be done. You know, obviously, you know, we're not living in, you know, an equal uh, society, you know, overall. And so I'm very excited about, you know, and welcome, you know, true stories from women and people of color and women of color being, you know, welcome in our industry. Um, here's a question that we have from Carolyn Morissette, um, and this is about the editing process, which I'm always fascinated with. I'm a terrible editor, but my husband is a professional editor, so I'm just like, you guys do magic. Um, so she says, how involved are you with editing, and do you generally enjoy dislike this aspect of filmmaking? Um, and this kind of ties into my my uh, other idea of um, this kind of um, 
control, you know, how much control do you feel like you uh, can or have exerted on, on your projects? I come from an editorial background. And so I, it, you know, not, not that this is what um, I like to do, but in the past it's been like, um, I could edit this movie, um, but mm -hmm. I, know, I know there are better editors than me. Um, and it, I love the editing process. You know, it's arguably, of, of the three, you know, writing, production, and post, it's arguably the most important part because it's when you finally get to craft it before it goes out into the world and you don't control it anymore. So I, I adore the editing process. It's certainly, uh, it's easy to get lost in there, though, you know, just to not see the forest for the trees. But um, I, I would encourage anyone who's, you know, e even emerging directors to learn how to edit um, mm -hmm. because there's, there's so much uh, storytelling in the cut and the instinctive rhythm and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I love the editing process too. I mean, we've we've heard it's like the second part of writing something, and it certainly is, um, because it's no longer theoretical, right? It's the footage that you actually have, and you will most likely not get more footage. So, what is to be done, and how is the story to be told? Um, and sometimes that's radical reimagination. Um, and in terms of control, I mean. Uh, you know, for all of us as filmmakers and creators, the more you are familiar with the tools of our trade and the actual craft itself, um, especially editing, you know, and I would say production is the more power you have over mm -hmm. not only, you know, against the world around you and, and but in terms of how in, in terms of playing with a craft, in terms of playing with the idea of the language, um, you know, on set, you know, uh, and, and in post. So, and then it gives you the, the great ability then to talk, because this is a community and a village that creates a film, to all the artisans that you ha absolutely have to rely on 100%, you know, in, in every stage of, of making a film. And Amy, you do edit um, your own work, but you, I know you work with other people, but can, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, just also to, to what Vina just said is like, I, I also get my hands in the budget, like intensely. Like I know that there's a lot of filmmakers that say that they don't want to think about it and, that, and they just want what they want. Like I, and and this is one for, coming from the indie world, but then even on uh, the Girlfriend Experience, they that I was an EP. So I was very, very active on the, on that because, because you, the, the, you know, you, I didn't have, uh, it was, it was, it, I had more money than I had for my independent films, but I, we did, it was still a small budget. And, the, and at the end of the day, you're still working against the, the, the money, right. Mm -hmm. And what, what your resources are. So I find that the, the money is creative for me. It allows me, um, it allows me to do what I want, but the, in terms of like editing, yeah, with, with She Dies Tomorrow, I mean, I, I had edited all, all of my other stuff and worked with other editors, um, obviously not in the girlfriend experience, but I I actually wanted to, as opposed to having that rigidity of the process, I wanted to shoot, then edit, and then write. So I did these chunks of time, and it was all about, for me, um, in addition to creating something that, that that I wanted to like sort of have this process through. It was also about breaking Amy, up. Yeah. I feel like I'm so sorry. I think yeah. <laughs> I have to cut us off because we're about to end. And I just oh, no, want to no. make sure yeah. that I, that I, um, you guys should seek out Amy's work. You should seek out Roseanne's work. You should seek out Vina's work. Um, and then also please watch Shadow in the Clouds, Roseanne's uh, movie that's coming to TIFF. Um, thank you so much for everyone to join. And uh, thank you to all of you for, for being here, all these wonderful panelists. You guys are all clapping at home, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.